tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the show. The darkness has found you. Well, it seems we have reached Season 6, Episode 10. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and welcome back. This evening's tale of twisted terror comes to us from author C.L. Horton. It's about a young man named Michael Fellner, a young student who is lost and looking for answers. Well, you see, this fella thinks he's finally found what he's looking for inside a new cult, called Cult Nil. We've all gone through that phase, am I right? However, Michael soon realizes, as we all have at one time, that in finding his truth, there is always room for more lies. Now, the group he thought could be his salvation has Michael running away for his life. You're listening to the standard edition of this program, If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now... Allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And with that out of the way, drink up, folks! From author C.L. Horton, I give you Cult Nil. The way I heard about Cult Nil was through my roommate, Tyler. He was a douche, but he loosened up once he had a few beers in him, and a few joints, and was surprisingly tolerable. One night, we were hanging out in our dorm room with my girlfriend Emily, and Tyler started to tell me about something he had read online about this cult. A cult that claimed that it wasn't a cult, which is pretty much what every cult does, because everybody knows the negative connotations that come with being labeled a cult. It's a well-known fact that cults want to get your money inside your mind, or they'll probably molest your mom, sister, or you once you're inside the cult long enough. 
you might as well add dear old dad into the mix while you're at it, and I hope you don't have any pets. Nah, man, these guys aren't like that, Tyler said in his now mellow tone. His leg was propped up on his desk, leaning back in his chair against our bunk bed for support, smoking a joint. See, cults have leaders. This cult, group, doesn't have any leaders. Every time you go to one of their seminars, there's always a different person talking to the audience. So? I said, skeptically. That just means that they've indoctrinated enough people to peddle you their bullshit. I scoffed. You're like... <laughs> like so repressed, Fellner. Coming from a guy who wears his flip-flops into our shower every morning. Tyler started laughing. Smoke started coming out of his mouth in little puffs. <laughs> Fuck you, man. <laughs> I shine a black light in that shower and you won't get in there again without some elevator shoes on. Oh, yeah. Emily started laughing and I did too, because I was high. Anyway, these guys are coming to speak here tomorrow, in the Chapman Auditorium. The school's letting these guys come here? A comedian that cusses isn't allowed to come here, but a freaking cult can come here and speak? I said, incredulously. It's not a cult, though, man. I keep telling you, Tyler happily replied. Right, not a cult. Cult nil, the I can't believe it's not a cult of cults. Philistine. Tyler waved me off. He started tapping on his tablet, and he motioned Emily and me to come over to him. O oh, ye of little faith. Begrudgingly, we got up and looked at the screen on his tablet. There was a convention room on the screen, the kind you find in almost any generic hotel throughout the country. There were probably about a hundred or so plastic green chairs in the room. However, probably only 20 to 25 percent of them had any people sitting in them. A guy walked out onto the stage. He was black and his hair was in the early stages of graying and was beginning to recede. He had a manly black goatee with hints of white at its bottom edges. There was a little podium there for him to stand at and talk into, but he just reached over it, took a microphone off the podium, and began to speak. Hello, said the man. The crowd, such as it was, didn't respond. No, 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 this isn't any way to start this. Let's try this again. I said, hello. He held the microphone out towards the crowd. The way he did, it was kind of funny. Maybe he was a comedian. The crowd didn't respond again, but it didn't phase him. Okay, okay, you're a little nervous. It's understandable. I am too. This is my first time speaking to a crowd, so let's just jump right on into this. First off, do you like it? The man started showing off his clothes. It was a flannel plaid shirt tucked into some dark blue jeans. I call it lumber chic. It's like 2005 never died. I laughed. Some of the crowd did too. He had a certain type of charisma. I bet you thought I would come out here in white, in a robe or something, or in a Technicolor dream suit. No, no, that's not what Colt Nil is all about. I... Sorry, I... The mood of the man changed suddenly. The mood of the whole damn room changed. He just stopped. He was so light-hearted just a second before... And now I wanted to reach out and hug this guy. He was holding back something. Something that was caught in the back of his throat that he couldn't let out. It seemed like it took a full minute before he started speaking again. But you didn't want to fast forward the video. You just kept watching. Waiting for whatever it was he was unable to say to finally be revealed. I... Lost my little girl three years ago. It wasn't cancer. It wasn't some incurable disease. 
I... I left her in the goddamn... His lips started to tremble, and a huge tear fell down his left cheek. Another thirty seconds passed, but it didn't feel long at all. There was no way you would stop watching now. You couldn't. I left her in the back seat of my car. I was running late for work. I hadn't slept that well that night. Hell, I was a brand new dad. I hadn't slept well since she was born. So I'm taking her to my mom's, which happens to be the same way I go to work. Except there's just this one... There's just this one turn... I go left to my mom's to drop off Leslie. That's my... That was my little girl. And then I back out and go to work. I had done this at least a hundred times already. At least. Except... I forgot to turn to go to my mom's one day. If I had just made that damn turn... He drifted off again. Another fifteen or so seconds went by. The man was reliving the incident in his head. You could see his pain. You could hear a pin drop in that room. You could hear a pin drop in our dorm room, too. If I had just made that turn, that one single turn, my little girl who was asleep in the back seat of my car, would still be alive today. One lady in the audience gasped. I got off work, and that's where my life ended, man. I walked up to my car, seeing her like that in the back seat, knowing that I did that, I did that to somebody I loved. I did that to somebody I loved more than anyone else in the entire damn world. All because of my stupidity, my absent-mindedness. And for what? For work? For money? What mattered more than my little angel sitting dead fried in her little car seat in the back of that damn worthless car. It must have been, because why didn't I make that turn? Why? Can you tell me why? The room was dead silent for a little while again. The man pulled out one of the green chairs and sat down. He motioned to the crowd to come closer. Could you all, please... Please come in closer. This is taking so much from me. The people in the room all started to come in a little closer. People 15 to 20 chairs apart were now all sitting next to one another in a circle around this man. I lost everything that day. I lost my little girl, Leslie. My little angel. I lost my wife... My mother hated me. I lost the job, the job that I valued so much that it made me forget my other responsibilities. My most important responsibility. My daughter. I wanted to die. I almost did, too. I decided to end my life. What was the point? What was the reason for it all? The man stood up and the audience was captivated by him. It was like they were in a trance. So I was going to do it. I was going to jump off of a building. And I don't know why, but for some reason I stopped off on the way before I did it. I thought I might as well have one more cup of coffee before I jump off and... You know... So I'm walking with my coffee, letting it cool down, when I see a pamphlet tacked onto a telephone pole in front of the store. It read, If your life means nothing, then so will your death. Zero saves us all. 
called nil. This podcast and episode of Horror Hill is sponsored and brought to you by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Newfound friends and listeners, our world is fraught with changes. Any number of small things can throw your day or mood completely off kilter. The fact is, change is hard, and oftentimes there's seldom you can do to control the unwanted variables of life. But you know what, my friends? We are all going to be okay. Who knows what the next weeks or months will bring, but I'll be here for you, loudly and proudly, to help soothe you through the horrors of the week. And it's not just me, either. There are so many options to bring therapeutic relief these days. And you had to know this was coming. I'm here to tell you about my favorite one. I'm talking about Drum roll, please. BetterHelp Online Therapy. BetterHelp is online therapy that'll help you get focused on the things that matter quickly, conveniently, and inexpensively. It's more affordable than traditional therapy, soothing the financial worry that life is already so fraught with. BetterHelp can be the right help for you, and whatever makes you feel like you just can't go on the same. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with a therapist who specializes in your problems. You can text anytime and schedule calls or Zoom meetings weekly. With BetterHelp, help is never more than a text away. It's professional counseling in your pocket. I want you to start living a happier life today and thrive, not just survive. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash horrorhill. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash horrorhill. A woman wearing a fast food restaurant shirt came onto the screen. She was way too happy to be working in a fast food restaurant, and she began breaking the fourth wall. Hi, are you hungry? I know I am, and I have the place for you. Here at... Tyler hit the skip ad button. What happens next? I said in exasperation. That's how they all end, said Tyler. Well, that blows, I said. How else do you think they'll get you to come to their seminars to listen to them sell you their bullshit? Emily said. Tyler pointed at Emily. See, she gets it. I conceded that they had a point. So, next week I decided I'd go check out Colt Nil. Tyler couldn't make it. He had a class. Emily wasn't interested. However, I considered myself of at least average, too above average, intelligence. That guy's story could have been a complete lie to soften up the audience. Sympathy is one way to get people to connect to you the fastest. Everybody knows that. So I decided to go to the seminar 15 minutes late. Skip the indoctrination part and just go for what they're selling. That way, I'm not softened up by the rest of it. I just wanted to get to the facts of what they wanted to sell me, because everybody is selling something to you at the end of the day. It's sad. I'm only 19, and I'm already so jaded. I walked into the Chapman Auditorium 20 minutes late and saw an older guy with white hair and a blue Oxford shirt. His sleeves were rolled up on his shirt, and he was wearing khakis and brown loafers with no socks on. He smiled when I entered the room. His smile seemed genuine and inviting. Oh, another visitor. Come, join us. All of the kids and a few teachers turned back and they all looked at me. 
shit. I hoped to sneak in and sit in the back unnoticed, backslider style. I slowly walked towards the group, but I still sat as far back as possible. I plopped down and folded my arms in a defensive position, throwing my backpack into the empty seat, showing this guy he's not suckering me in. It'll take more than a smile to sucker in Michael Fellner. The man shook his head like he understood my skepticism, but he didn't call me out. Well, now that we're all here and you've heard my story, some of you anyway. The man looked at me jokingly. A few people laughed. What is Cult Nil about exactly? In essence, it's about being saved by zero. Everything can be saved by zero. What does that mean? Said a girl with glasses off to the left. They're just nihilists, said a kid in the front row. A few people laughed. Ah, nihilists, said the gray-haired speaker. No, that sounds exhausting. Quoting Big Lebowski? So, at least he's not 100% crazy. Nihilists believe in absolutely nothing. At Cult Nil... We believe that certain religions' tenets are core to being human. So you just choose what parts of the religions you like and make up your own, right? Shit. I wasn't going to say anything, but I couldn't help myself. The guy speaking wasn't phased at all by my confrontational tone. He possessed such peace. He seemed like he had it all figured out. It couldn't be real. You don't think that's how all religions are formed? I guess he had a point. A few kids in the audience gave me shooting dagger stares to shut up. I got the hint and decided to let him speak and not say anything. This time for sure. Cult Nil believes this. We are here on this world and all that we currently know is told to us. This world was shaped by people and ideas that we did not have any say in as they were being formed. Religion, government, society, beliefs, science, all of it. We take it at face value that, just as when our parents told us something, it must be true. But why do they believe it to be true? Their parents told them, and then their parents told them the same thing. That's not to say that everything that we know is a lie until this point, but is it an absolute truth? They say science is an absolute, but modern science is all theory. Black holes aren't known to exist truly. String theory and alternate dimensions, they're only ideas, all unproven. You can calculate on a chalkboard all day long, but it's just another theory until I'm staring at my doppelganger in another dimension. And religion, look at how many there are. From Crowley to Buddha, men were trying to figure this world out. It was what worked for them. If it's what works for you, science and religion, or maybe a combination of the two, that's fine. I'm not a god, big G or the little g. I'm just a man with another theory to offer you. The man was pacing back and forth as he talked. At that time, he stopped and he looked right at me. It felt like it anyway. And that theory is this. We don't know why we're here. We have come up with reasons for why we're here, but we don't know. You're a demographic that some ideas work for you to stay in, to stay grounded in this thing called life, and some don't. This idea that I'm speaking about may not be for you. I'm not even saying it's an absolute truth, but... It is a sincere and honest belief 
as sincere and honest as any idea that came before it. And if these other ideas have not worked for you, for the world, maybe if enough people practice them, it can change the world. I believe you can be saved by wiping the slate clean. Every idea and theology that has ever been put inside your head is just an idea, not a fact. Set your mind to zero. Nil. However, I'm not going to fill it with something else. An entity from outer space isn't going to save your soul. You are not going to live forever. You are not going to be punished or rewarded in another life. This, said the man as he pointed around to each of the audience, this is what you have. This moment and every moment until the day that you die. That could be tomorrow. That could be 50 years from now. But that's what grounds you at Cult Nil. The belief in absolutely nothing scares and contradicts everything we are taught to believe in. It can be terrifying at first, but if you can, consider it. If you can accept that we're all scared and that the beliefs that we were indoctrinated with as children were just fairy tales that they filled our minds with so that our parents and our parents' parents could find an excuse to wake up the next morning, then you'll truly be free. Free to do what? Shit, I did it again. The man smiled. Free to live a true life. The truth you have in you is not what I can offer or anyone else can, and there's only one problem with that, the man said, and he sat back down on one of the chairs again. What? said the girl with the glasses on. She was off to the left side. Thank God I wasn't the only one. What a freak. To be free, you have to set your mind to zero. Nil. Everything has to be reset. There are a few rules, though. The man's tone changed. Marriages are to be respected. People are to be respected. Fighting is not acceptable, and anyone who's out to exploit people looking for their truth will be expelled from the organization. How do you pay for it all? Damn it, I suck. The man smiled. All our members, the ones who live on the commune, donate all their money into one fund. A fund is drained down to the last dollar by the end of each fiscal year. Until it is nil, there is no excess to be used or amassed by one individual at any given time. I didn't come here in a limo. I drove here in a Hyundai. I'm not offering riches or poverty. I'm offering an existence and freedom from indoctrination. A way to find your way. A teacher from the school stood up suddenly. Okay, thank you, Mr. Strandler. Let's give him a round of applause for sharing his uh, interesting ideas today. The room entered into a half-hearted round of applause. Everyone started gathering their stuff up and making their way out of the auditorium. Before you go, please grab a few pamphlets on your way out. Share them with somebody you know. All of my contact information is there. Thanks for coming, all of you. Nobody was paying him any attention, but he didn't seem bothered by it at all. He seemed completely at peace. I couldn't even decide what to eat most nights, and he appeared to have what he was offering. Nothing. But nothing that led to what, exactly? Everything? Everybody left. The girl with glasses on the left was talking to... What did the teacher say his name was? Mr. Strandler? She was done, and I walked up to him as she walked by. Hello. Can I interest you in some pamphlets, Mr... Michael. Michael Fellner. I can see by looking at you. 
You're a skeptic, Mr. Fellner. You don't know what to make of me, do you? Because I'm giving you everything up front. You don't know what angle I'm working on because I haven't deflected your questions, have I? As they say, I haven't tried to get personal with you or figure you out. You have nothing to confront me with because I'm giving you everything. And by giving you everything, I'm giving you... Nil, I said. I kind of smiled without meaning to. It was funny. Except the money thing. You are getting something there. And money is also an artificial construct or idea. Yes, that is also true. Perceptive for your age. So, you think this is some sort of grift, huh? I'll give you even more proof to assuage your concerns about my sincerity, Mr. Fellner. Look up Adrian Strandler III when you get home tonight. Here's a pamphlet with my contact information. Get back to me if you feel like you have any more concerns about my true intentions. My Hyundai awaits if you'll excuse me, and I have a long drive back to the commune. He stood up and started to walk out of the auditorium. He talked over his shoulder as he walked out of the building. But wait, he called it a commune. He called it a cult. It's cult nil. Why would he say these things if he was trying to trick me? Maybe it's not a trick after all. He pushed open the doors and left me in the auditorium by myself. The sound of the door slamming echoed in the large room, enhancing my feeling of isolation. It almost felt like a cell door being closed in my prison. I didn't know what to think. I sat down on the floor and I didn't know why. Or maybe I did. But I wept. I sat there with my head in my hands and I wept. I wept for joy. I wept with sadness. I wept because I thought I found the truth I had been desperately seeking my entire life. I wept for all of the damn lies that had come before now, before this moment where I had finally found myself. And I had found myself inside of nothing. I saw the irony of it all, in trying to find something my whole life, I had found nothing. And in finding nothing, I had finally found something. I had found peace. And I had found peace because I had found nil. I went back to my dorm room after calming down a bit. As I walked down the hallway, I saw Emily leaving my room in a hurry. She didn't see me. Unfortunately, I had a feeling why she had been in my room without me being there. I walked in and Tyler was sitting in his bed. He was under the covers, with his shirt off. Shit, man! Tyler covered himself up with his blanket. I thought you had a class. Oh, I did. I decided to skip it. Oh, you usually don't... Ditch class? Yeah, I don't. You know my schedule pretty well, don't you, Tyler? Tyler sat up in his bed. He looked a little angry. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Just forget it. I grabbed my laptop and headed out to the library. They have study rooms there that are private. I shut the dorm room door on Tyler without saying anything else. I thought that Tyler and Emily were fucking behind my back. I had suspected it for a while by that point, but I didn't want to believe it. She seemed so genuine, so kind. But if she was doing that, she wasn't anything but another lie. It was easy to reset my mind to nil on almost everything I knew about the world up until then. Religion, politics, etc. Why was it so hard to set my mind to zero when it came to Emily? 
If anything, I should hate her for what she had done, for what she had been doing. But I couldn't bring myself to hate her for some reason. I shut the door to the study room in the library, and I looked up Adrian Strandler III. There he was. Ten years ago, he was a successful entrepreneur. He had a huge hedge fund that made out like gangbusters during the housing crisis. Except, instead of cashing in, did he cash out? He gave away almost everything and disappeared. The guy was reportedly worth $700 million, and then he just upped and vanished. I guess he was saved by nil. He practiced what he preached. At least, that's what he wanted you to believe. I went back to my dorm room and started to pack my bags. Tyler wasn't there, thank God. I was almost done when I heard a knock on the door. It was Emily. Tyler isn't here, I said coldly. She looked surprised. I'm not here to see Tyler. Where have you been? What's all this stuff? Are you going somewhere? Yeah, I said. Are you going to tell me where? Don't you think I deserve to know? We all have things that sneak up on us in this life. Surprises. You think you know somebody and they disappoint you eventually. They hurt you. I don't know what you're talking about, Emily said. I know. I'll be back in a few days. I'm just going to my parents. I lied. Are they okay? What's wrong, Michael? Maybe I could go with you. No, I said. I appreciate it, but thanks. I was tired of talking to her. I cared for her, but it was like looking at a cracked mirror. Everything was broken. Everything was distorted. I used to see the beauty in her. Now I could only see fractions, pieces of something that used to be mine. Tyler walked up. Hey, what's up? Nothing, I said, and I walked away, leaving them in the dorm room. They could have it and do whatever they wanted to there. I needed answers, and I was going to get them one way or the other. The commune for Cult Nil was only 105 miles away from my school. I pulled up, and a man dressed in plain clothes met me at the front desk. I assumed this was Nil's security. The man was congenial, just wondering what I wanted. When I told him I wanted to see Adrian Strandler III, he shook his head and told me to park my car. We walked towards the hotel, and we went inside. There were tons of people inside, doing different things. None of them looked stressed or like they wanted to leave. Most didn't even seem to notice I was there. We continued and there was a pool in the middle of the hotel. A few kids were swimming around. They looked like they were having a genuinely good time. A cute lifeguard, a blonde with a very nice figure, seemed to be looking after them. She didn't look my way. The guard took me to a door that read 7, and he knocked on it. A few seconds later, Adrian Strandler III opened the door. He was wearing sunglasses, and he was dressed in a Hawaiian shirt and had gray shorts on with sandals. He had a drink in his hand. I think it was tea. He looked at me a minute, and then he smiled. So, you decided to look me up, Mr. Fellner. It's okay, Che. I'll take it from here. You got it, Adrian. He did a little half-hearted salute with his index and middle finger and walked off. Come on in. I walked inside the room, and even though it was nice, it was a very modest apartment, nothing extravagant. I sat down on a nearby wooden chair with a padded seat next to the nightstand. Please take a seat, said Adrian with a smile. Why did you leave it all behind? I said. Adrian smiled. Leave all of what behind? Adrian said, coyly. You were worth millions. 
That is, if it wasn't some site that you set up to make it look like you were worth millions. Adrian laughed. <laughs> Would you like some tea? I shook my head no. Adrian sat down on the bed across from me. He took a sip of his tea and set it on the nightstand on a coaster. I told myself that if he started to take his shirt off, I would run out the door. Instead, he pulled out his wallet and threw it toward me. I caught it and I looked at him. Go ahead, open it up, Adrian said. I opened up the small leather wallet. There were ten dollars in it, his driver's license, and what looked like a gift card to a pizza place I'd never heard of. So, I said, what's this supposed to prove? Adrian held out his hand for me to give his wallet back. I did. Nothing. You can't judge a man by what he has inside his wallet. As you said before, money is a manufactured construct. A piece of paper isn't worth anything unless we all agree that the number printed on it means something. If I had 70 million more of those $10 bills, do you think I'd be more of a man than right now? I wasn't sure what to say to that. Money is what makes life easier, isn't it? What makes somebody more? Isn't that what they tell us? Isn't that why we go to school? To do more, to be more, so that we can earn more? I can tell that you don't know the answer to that. And how could you? You're just a kid. I did have millions at one time. Hundreds of millions. And I can tell you I'm much happier now with that ten dollars in my wallet than when I had millions at my disposal. He stood up and grabbed his tea again. I didn't know what to believe. So why are you here, Mr. Fellner? Do you even know? Adrian said. No, I didn't. How did he always know what I was thinking? I guess I want to know more. I want to know if it's real, if what you say is true. Adrian looked at me for a moment. Was he determining the extent of my sincerity? All right. I think we have a spot for you to stay the night. Tomorrow I can show you around. You can decide for yourself. Decide what? I said. Your future. If this life, this way, is for you. Thank you. I, I don't have any money, though. I sort of spent it all to get here. It was true. I didn't even know how to get back to school. I didn't have any money for gas, and I wasn't sure how I was going to get back. Adrian smiled. It's like he knew what I was thinking again. He took his wallet, took the ten dollars out, and handed it to me. It was hanging in the air for a second, and he waved it again encouragingly. It's okay. Take it. And I did. Adrian got me set up in a room similar to the one he had been in, and I took a shower. I fell back on the bed, exhausted, when I heard a knock at my door. A guy was standing there with a tray of food. It was a turkey club with some fries. It was good. I guess the turkey lived up to its reputation, and I conked out at some point watching TV. I don't know how long I was out when I heard somebody opening up my door. My heart started racing. Is this where the hunt for me would begin? A figure was standing in my doorway, backlit by the moonlight. It was the shape of a slim, beautiful woman. I think it was the lifeguard I saw earlier that evening watching the kids. Was I dreaming? She stood there for a moment, and then she smiled. Her teeth showed like a star in the darkness. She was wearing a see-through white bathing suit cover-up that reached the mid-part of her thighs. The effect of the thin, white material was almost ghostly. She shut the door behind her softly, locking the deadbolt behind her. 
I wanted to say something, but I couldn't speak. It didn't seem real. She put her finger up to her lips and said, Shh. She took the covering off, and all she had on was a pair of small white panties. She took them off smoothly. Her body was tan, except for where her bathing suit had covered her up. These untanned white areas stood out like neon lights on her firm body inside the otherwise dark room. She was still hot from absorbing the heat of the day. She put her legs around my waist, one leg at a time on the bed, and started kissing me gently on my cheeks and then on my lips. My mind raced with confusion, but I quickly gave in to the moment. All of my questions were replaced by animal instinct, and all I thought about was what we could do for each other, then and there. Nothing else seemed to matter. When it was over, she didn't say a word. She kissed me and then got up and left. I smiled to myself. And then I felt sick because I suddenly remembered Emily. My smile disappeared, and I soon realized what I had done. These things didn't just happen, especially to somebody like me. I needed to keep my guard up tomorrow. Then I started thinking about it harder. Did they have me on camera? Shit. What had I gotten myself into? The next morning, Adrian showed me around the converted hotel. They had bought it cheap, and the cult members, uh, the group, had fixed it up. Everybody pretty much had regular jobs, and they donated their money to the rest of the group to keep the commune going. Like Adrian, some of the members worked for the actual commune itself and were paid by the other members of the community. I thought I had him at this, thinking it was some exuberant amount, except it turned out if he was being honest, that is, that Adrian only got paid $35 a day to manage the commune. That's a far cry from the millions he used to pull in. We continued, and I saw the girl from last night. She was beautiful. She didn't even look at me, and she walked up to Adrian, hugged him, and gave him a huge kiss. It wasn't a daddy-daughter kiss, either. It was a passionate kiss that made me feel as inadequate as possible. Michael, I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Ainsley. Hello, said Ainsley in an upbeat fashion with a smile. She held her hand out for me to shake it. I wasn't sure what to do, but she looked like we had never met before which I suppose we hadn't. However, we had known each other in another, more intimate way. I quickly decided to play along, and I grabbed her hand and shook it. Hello, I managed to get out. Well, it was nice to meet you, but I need to go watch the kids at the pool. Oh, yes. Ainsley is a makeshift lifeguard here for the residents who have children. Ah, I said. She was gorgeous. I tried to look anywhere else but at her. I didn't think that I could hide my true feelings if I did. I probably had revealed them already, my mouth hanging open like an idiot gawker. I hoped Adrian hadn't noticed. Goodbye. And Ainsley ran off. See you later, my dear, waved Adrian as she left us. Adrian smiled at me, and we continued the tour. We stopped inside the hotel's bar area, and Adrian bought me a Coke. He seemed to have bought another tea. So, what do you think of the commune? Seems nice. It wasn't what I was suspecting. Expecting, Adrian corrected. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I laughed. Expecting. Just like you weren't expecting to get fucked by my wife last night?
I was in the middle of a sip of my coke when I started to choke and cough, trying not to get it everywhere. I started waving my arms back and forth in a you've got me all wrong fashion when Adrian grabbed some napkins off the table and handed them to me. No, no, that is, I didn't know. I swear I wouldn't have if I'd known that you... It's all right, Michael, Adrian reassured me. What? I said as I cleaned up myself and the table. It's one of the benefits of being saved by Nil. Of course, my wife and I share a bond, but if she wants to share herself that way, that's her choice. Just as she allows me to do the same with any willing participant. However, we still come home to each other at the night's end. We will always be one. We may share our bodies, but we do not share our hearts. At least, with any others. That's pretty open-minded of you. And I thought about Emily and Tyler. Is something bothering you? I'm sorry if I made you uncomfortable. I was just being honest with you. It's just that I have this girlfriend. At least, I think she is. I think she's sleeping with my roommate behind my back. How does that make you feel? Like fucking shit, I said, honestly. I see. How do you not let that bother you? How does it not bother you, knowing that your wife did what she did with me? How does it not cheapen what you have together? Did it cheapen how you feel about your girlfriend? I thought about it. I could have slept with Adrian's wife a thousand times and it wouldn't have made me love Emily any less. It hadn't. I guess you're right. Sex is a primal thing. You want something and you take it. However, it's over if there's nothing left to build on when it's done. Your heart is set to nil, to zero. There are some you could spend your lifetime with, but you can fuck anything, Michael. Trust me, I know. Beautiful women come and go out of my life, and I desire them, but there is only one that I truly love. I went back to my room, and I decided to call Emily. Hey, I said. Hey, you just leave and tell me some bullshit about going home, which I know isn't true because I called your parents, Michael. You've been gone for two freaking days. Where the fu- I love you, I said. Are you? Said Emily in a shocked tone. I had never said that to her before. I had never said that to any girl before. I... I love you too, you asshole. We talked some more, and I told her everything. Everything except about Ainsley. I would when the time was right. She met me at the commune, and she hugged me. We went to my room, and we made love. It was awesome. To just be free and not be so high-strung as I usually was. I was saved by nil. Emily got out of the shower, blow-dried her hair, and then plopped down on the bed beside me, wearing one of my t-shirts with only a pair of panties on. So, when are we heading back tomorrow? I wasn't sure what she was talking about. Heading back? Yeah, to school. You can't stay here forever. Why not? Emily looked confused. Are you being serious right now? You can't quit school and join some cult. That's crazy. Is it? I said, a little annoyed. Because it feels pretty right to me. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm happy. Truly happy. Probably for the first time in my life. There was a knock at the door. I looked over at the door and then over at Emily. She was so beautiful. Well, go ahead and answer it. I walked over and opened the door, and my heart sank. It was Ainsley. 
She was wearing only a red bikini. She was a heartstopper, and because of that, I felt that world twist with malice as I instantly knew Emily would be uber pissed. Hi, said Ainsley. Hey, said Emily in an icy death tone. Ainsley smiled unapologetically and touched my arm. I instinctively recoiled at her touch. Wow, you've certainly changed, said Ainsley. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? said Emily. Nothing, I said, a little too emphatically. I mean, nothing. She's just playing around. I'd certainly like to, said Ainsley casually. She walked over to Emily and started to touch her hair. Get off me, said Emily, and swatted Ainsley's hand away. Ainsley remained cool and just smiled wickedly. She knew what she was doing. Sorry, you just looked like fun. I think we could all have fun together. Ainsley took her hand that had been hit and kissed it. She then ran it over my chest as she left the room. The door was still open. Maybe some other time then, when you're both ready. Holy shit, was I in trouble. Emily jumped off the bed and started throwing her things into her suitcase. I'm sorry, I... Emily held her hand up to stop me from speaking. Did you sleep with her? Emily, I... Did you sleep with her, Michael? I couldn't lie to her. I wouldn't lie to her. Yes. Oh my god. A tear went down her face. When? It doesn't matter. The hell it doesn't? When? She yelled. Last night. I could see the hurt on her face. You fucked her last night? And then you slept with me today? Oh my god, you asshole! She started gathering up her things again. I was tired of being run over. Yeah, what about you, huh? What about me? You and Tyler, just the other night. I saw you coming out of my room. When I walked in, he was in his bed. His shirt was off. Hmm, yeah? You were leaving in a mighty big hurry, weren't you? Afraid I was going to catch you two? Emily's eyes widened in surprise, and then she started gathering her things even more quickly. She finished packing, and then she began to walk out the door, walking by me without looking at me. Don't have an answer for that, do you? I said smugly, and I sat down on the bed to watch her leave. Go ahead and leave. I hadn't done anything to her that she hadn't already done to me. I had made my case. Emily held her hand on the doorknob, looking outside at the night sky and not at me. It looked like she was weighing her options about whether or not it was worth speaking to me again when she looked back inside the room. I was looking for you, you asshole. Yeah, he tried to hit on me. He always does. But I left out of your room in a hurry because you weren't there, and he's a dick. So fuck you! And she slammed the door behind her. If what she said was true, then I was an asshole. But she could have been lying. I'm pretty sure she wasn't, though. Nil didn't save me that night, because, once again, Ainsley entered my room. We did it again. I was so weak. I cried as she sat on top of me. It only made her go faster. I released inside of her, and I thought of Emily. I'm so messed up. What was happening to me? A month or two went by, and I lived in the commune. To help out the community, I went on seminars with different members. Sometimes it was with Adrian, and sometimes it wasn't. 
We talked mostly to colleges and younger people. Life in the commune wasn't that bad. It beat the hell out of school. Ainsley came over several more times. I never resisted. The last time she came into my room, she brought another girl named Lisa, a member who came from Arizona, I think. And even though it was amazing, I could never truly forget Emily. Ainsley stopped coming over after that night. I noticed there was another new guy that joined. He probably took my place. It was fine. I didn't care. I never saw any incident where anybody was mistreated or overworked. I'm not saying that there weren't any fights or disagreements. That was the main thing, though. If anything, Colt Nil seemed to be interested in creating a healthy debate. Mindful exchanges of what was best on how to do things. By being reset to zero, Colt Nil was asking us, its members, what was the best way to do things heading forward. This created heated discussions, but there was only one case where one member, Sam, was kicked out for starting a fight. That was where the line was drawn. No violence was allowed unless we were protecting another member from being harmed. Another month passed, and I called Emily. She didn't want to talk to me. I understood. I told her I never wanted to hurt her, and she said that it was too late to apologize. I told her I was sorry again, and she hung up the phone without saying anything back. It was hard, but I let it go. I had to. I set my heart back to nil. The best that I could, anyway. Adrian told me he had a surprise for me and to meet him in his room later that evening. When I came over, Ainsley was leaving the room. She looked like she had been crying, and she walked by me like she didn't even see me there. I stood in the doorway a moment, not sure what to do. Should I go after her? When Adrian walked up with a glass of iced tea in his hand. Michael, glad you could make it. Come in, I have something to share with you. I walked inside the room and I sat down. Sure, what's up? We going somewhere? Adrian smiled. Not we, only me. Where? I asked. Michael, I'm proud of how you've worked out here. You've done well, and if I may be so bold, I consider you to be an old soul despite our age difference. Also, a friend. I was honored. Of course, I felt the same way. Did he know that? He'd been a better father to me in some ways than my own. Yeah, I feel the same. Adrian smiled and looked down at the floor a moment. He seemed to disappear into thought. When he looked up, he looked at peace again. I'm dying, Michael. I didn't know what to say. What? I said in disbelief. I'm dying. I have cancer. It spread fairly quickly, and I want my death to count for something. I want you to help me die. My jaw dropped. What the fuck was he expecting me to do? No, I'm sure there's another way to stop. No, there is no other way, Adrian said. I'm committed to this cause. It's been my life. It saved my life. So now I'm willing to give my life for it and I want you to help me do it. I... I don't understand. I stood up and put my arms on top of my head, trying to take this all in. What was he expecting me to do? What did I have to do with this? Adrian stood up, walked over, and he hugged me. Not in a creepy way, but in a fatherly, consoling way. I resisted at first, but I soon gave in to the moment and collapsed into his embrace. I'm not proud of it, but 
I began to cry. He didn't pull away, and he shushed me. He told me it would be fine. After a moment, he calmed me down, pulled back, held me by my arms, and looked into my eyes. I understand. I feel the same. This is why I'm asking you to do this. I wouldn't want anybody else to do this. Besides Ainsley, you are the most important person in my life. I took it all in. I listened to what he said, and I told him I would think about it. He said he understood. A week went by, and it was time for the ceremony. I agreed to do it, but when the time came, I wasn't sure I could go through with it. We stood on the stage that was set up just for the ceremony. Everyone was dressed in white, even me. The stage was covered in white. Even the wood structure underneath had been painted white. About three to four hundred people had come in from different communes and other states to witness the event. I felt like I was going to puke. Ainsley walked up in an almost wedding dress. She was beautiful and she started speaking to the crowd that sat before her. Row upon row of white shone out in the night. Thank you for coming. Our society prides itself on not having any leaders. However, we can all agree that Cult Nil would never be as successful as it has been if it hadn't been for my husband, the love of my life, Adrian Strandler III. Adrian walked out onto the stage, and the crowd clapped and cheered. Adrian held up his hand and calmed the crowd. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It means a lot. As you know, I'm dying. I'm dying, and to truly be saved by nil, it doesn't matter. And what I mean by that is that I won't be around to share my life with you and my lovely wife, Ainsley, but it doesn't matter that I have found peace because I have found all of you. I have been saved by nil. The crowd cheered and clapped some more, for longer this time. Adrian asked the crowd to calm down again. I've asked my dear friend here, Michael, to help me transition to the end. I go into this next life knowing I won't go to some mythical eternal Eden. Instead, I will go where we all go. I will return to Nil. Ainsley walked up, and she was holding a long white box. Some type of music started to play in the background. I'd heard it before, but I didn't know the song's name. Ainsley opened up the box and presented it to Adrian. He took something long and sharp out of the box and held it over his head. It was a knife. A huge knife. The crowd clapped and cheered. I choose this way to go. I choose this way to end it. My fate is in my own hands. Now, my fate is in yours. And Adrian handed the knife to me. Adrian looked at me with his calm, kindly demeanor. It's okay, Michael. You can do this. I shook my head no. No freaking way could I do this. I can't. I'm sorry, I just can't. Do it! Adrian screamed at me. His features contorted into anger. I'd never seen him like that before. No! I screamed back. You will do this! Now! I tried to drop the knife, but he gripped my hands and held them and the knife. God, it was so sharp. Tightly. Do it! Do it now! No! I screamed. But it was too late. 
he was too strong. He used my hands to shove the knife inside of his chest. It went in so easily. Blood started to spread all over his white suit. I think I heard a few people scream. Adrian fell to the stage. Red, viscous liquid started to fill in the white where we were all standing in a great pool. Tears filled my eyes, and I dropped to my knees and pulled Adrian up into my arms. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, undereating, and overeating. We associate burnout with work, but that's not the only cause. Mental burnout can sneak up on you in any number of ways, with any number of causes. But as I was saying in the bit earlier, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life. What better time to start taking charge of your mental health? What better time to check out BetterHelp? BetterHelp is the online counseling service that can make 2022 your best year ever. Whatever it is that holds you back, be it depression, loneliness, anxiety, or anything else, BetterHelp can help you get back on track. It's tough to stew in your own juices with your very own licensed therapist at your fingertips. It's quick, discreet, convenient, and at a price anyone can afford. Here's the deal. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with your own licensed therapist. You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. You can schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. It's such a great innovation, over 1 million people are using it to get a handle on their mental health. What's more is BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. The last thing you need to do is worry about how you don't like how the camera makes you look when you're trying to soothe your soul. You have no problem paying for that gym membership that you don't use. Why not put that time and money towards achieving better physical and mental wellness, and from the comforts of your own home, no less? I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash horror hill. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash horror hill thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors he smiled and blood started spilling out of his mouth you did well you did so well I'm so proud of you, Michael. I held him in my arms and I sobbed. What had just happened? Why would he make me be a part of this? Why? We buried him the next day. Hundreds of people attended. Nobody acted as if I had killed him at the ceremony. Days went by and I didn't leave my room. I kept having visions of white rooms that filled with blood. Other members came in to check on me from time to time. Ainsley even came by. We didn't sleep together. They all told me I had done nothing wrong. It was what Adrian wanted. I was so messed up though, I just couldn't figure out why he had chosen me. 
After about a week, I ventured out again. Nobody treated me any differently. Everybody acted as if nothing had happened, and that freaked me out. It angered me. Ainsley walked up to me and told me to come into her room one day. I told her I couldn't be with her like that right now. She said that wasn't what she wanted me for, so I went with her. I walked inside the room, and a man was standing there with his back to me, wearing Adrian's Hawaiian shirt that he liked so much. He turned around, and the man looked just like Adrian, standing there before me, holding an iced tea. Hello, Michael, Adrian said in his calm tone. I stepped a few feet back and I looked around. This couldn't be real. Who the hell are you? I said. It's me, Michael. It's Adrian. I ran out of the room and I ran up the stairs and rushed into mine. I started gathering up my things as quickly as I could. Fuck this place. There's no way that I'm staying here. I got into my car and drove as fast as possible for the first few miles. Nobody seemed to be following me. I didn't know where I was going, and I ended up in the only place I knew where to go. I walked up to Emily's dorm room. It was 1 a.m. I knocked on her door. She opened the door up, and her eyes were squinting the light being let in behind me from the hallway temporarily impairing her vision. Michael? She said in a half-asleep, half-awake tone. The sliver of light behind me was enough to let me see a guy inside her bed. It was Tyler, sitting there with a dumb look on his face. His usual look. I turned and started heading down the hallway. I'm such an idiot. I thought she called out after me, but my heart was beating so fast it's all that I could hear inside of my ears. I was such a fool. Had they been together the whole time? Or had I pushed them together? I guess it didn't matter. I went inside the Chapman Auditorium. It was the only place I knew to go. Thank God it was open. I was broke. I didn't have any money. My parents disowned me when I quit school. I had nowhere else to go. I sat down on one of the seats and held my head in my hands. I couldn't even cry. I was cried out. I was just exhausted. But my mind raced and I couldn't sleep. I was hungry too. Shit. I was homeless. About an hour passed, and I finally conked out from being exhausted. I heard the Chapman Auditorium doors open, and it's him. Adrian, all dressed in white. Was I dreaming? He walked down the aisle and then turned in at the row of chairs directly behind mine. He assumed that sitting beside me might not be the best idea right now. He was right. He continued down and sat one chair over and one row behind me. I thought I might find you here, he said coyly. I looked at him. I looked at him long and hard. It was him. It wasn't a twin. It wasn't some plastic surgeon who created a facsimile of him. It was Adrian. How did you do it? I said. Adrian smiled. Do what? Fuck you, Adrian. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You were dead. You let me think I had killed you. Adrian never blinked. He was still so cool, so composed after everything. I hated him for it. I was saved by nil, Michael. I had nothing left to lose. I was dying, and you helped me truly end myself. I was at peace. 
I was gone, and now I'm here. Reborn. I shook my head in disbelief. Did he even hear himself? I felt the knife go inside of you. You couldn't have faked that. It wasn't one of those knives with springs, like for plays or movies. It was solid. I felt it. It was heavy and sharp. I know. I was there. I felt it. Jokes? He destroyed me, and he's telling me jokes? You ruined my life, I said. Adrian looked surprised. Did I? Your life was going so well before I met you? Is that why... He started pointing around the auditorium. Is that why you came here to see me that day? Your life was so wonderful? You had it all figured out? I had my girlfriend. I had somebody I loved. Adrian chuckled. How does somebody who seems to have all the answers and dances on the edge of your admiration make you want to bash their face at any given second? Oh, Michael, there will always be more girlfriends. Trust me. Can't you see I gave you so much more? I've allowed you to become my John the Baptist. John the Baptist had his head cut off. Adrian visually conceded the point. Peter, then. Crucified. I think you're taking me a little too literally here. I'm not claiming to be a messiah. I'm still just a man. A man who's been raised from the dead? Adrian shrugged coyly. You're not going to tell me how you did it, are you? Adrian got up and he placed his hand on my shoulder. I didn't swat him away. Even after everything he had done to me, it was like your dad's approving pat on the back. Like, good job well done. You're a good boy, Michael. If my path isn't yours, I can't force you to take it with me. You are always welcome back, though. Goodbye, Michael. And just like that, he headed out of the auditorium in a steady stroll. I never saw Adrian again. That was twenty years ago. The cult had its ups and downs, but it still existed. There were no sex scandals or mass suicides associated with the cult. I know because I kept up with them. A lot of people didn't believe in Adrian's self-proclaimed resurrection. However, just as many did. He never claimed to be a savior. He only claimed to be saved by nil. I went back to school, another school, and I finished this time. My parents started talking to me again. It was a long time before I ever dated again. It was harder to trust people now. I'm fairly successful. I work in an office as a mid-tier employee. I started a little family. I do okay, I guess. I guess you could say that I'm happy, for better or worse. I don't have all the answers, but I think I have it as about figured out as the next person who's being completely honest. In that, I don't. I take it one day at a time. Adrian ended up dying. Just the other day. There was a picture on the news of him. I don't know why, but I cried. It was probably the first time I'd cried since I thought I had killed Adrian. I received a package in the mail shortly after Adrian passed. It was in a white, small box. I opened it up, and there was a note inside it in Adrian's handwriting. I hope all finds you well. If you receive this, I'm sure that it means that I am now lifted from this mortal coil for good. Here's a little something to help you along the way. Take care, Michael. I look inside the box, and it's something small wrapped in white tissue paper. As I unwrap it, I see what it is. 
It's Adrian's wallet. The same exact one he had thrown at me all those years ago. All it has inside is his driver's license and the same unheard of pizza place gift card. There's no cash. I don't know why, but I laugh. I laugh while I cry. And such is life. You've been listening to Cult Nil by C.L. Horton. You can find more of this author's work on the Comixology platform, recently merged with Amazon. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and I'll see you right here at this same time next week. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tales performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda. Finalization by Craig Groshek and N.M. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave a kind comment. 
Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.